Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Jackie Brenner, a pre-med student who has enjoyed meeting other STEM students from all around the world through my TikTok and Discord STEM Potential. I created these STEM Potential webinars in order to combat the lack of mentorship and representation that I noticed in the STEM fields. We are an online Discord that provides networks for all students to share their unique perspectives from diverse backgrounds and create strong connections. Discord members can act as mentors and mentees as they progress along the stages of their education while also finding friends with common interests. I would like to give a special shout out to all of the members of STEM Potential team who made this possible. And I ask Ashini if you can turn on your camera just for a moment. I just wanna also extend this to Ashini who's been my rock through all of this and you know, helping make this possible, nothing would. I would not be here without her. So thank you, Ashini. I am proud and humbled to have assembled a group of incredibly successful um, students in medicine. This session will be highlighting three amazing perspectives. And I just wanna start off by allowing each panelist to give a three to five minute introduction. So Joel, if you wanna get us started. Sure, hey everyone. My name is Joel Bravel. I am a third year medical student at Washington State University. Uh, where we do our first two years in Spokane, Washington, and then our second two years in Portland, which is where I am right now. Um, so there's a heat wave going on. It's 111 degrees outside. I'm one of the lucky few um, to have air conditioning, so happy for that. But graduated um, from high school, went to college out at Yale University. After college, went to Boston University to get my master's degree, then decided to return back to Washington State. My parents are super happy about that, to have me back home but super excited to be here um, answering questions and just talking about my life. Thank you so much. Now on to Megan. Hi everyone. So my name is Meg or Megan. Um, I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I went to the University of Illinois for undergrad um, and then I took a couple gap years. So I took three years off um, before coming to Temple Medical School in Philadelphia where I'm currently a third year. Um, I just started my third year, my first rotation. I'm on psych um, and it has been a welcome change from the first two years of, of book learning in med school. So it's nice to finally be with people and patients doing like what I actually came here um, to do. So I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, so excited to like always encourage and see more faces, more queer faces who wanna be a part of the medical community. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And last but not least, Alex. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Alex Ray Rizzo. I'm also a third year medical student. I go to the St. Luke's program under Temple. So I spent my first year with Megan over in Philadelphia, um, but then my next three are at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania um, in the St. Luke's hospital system. So it's been really great. It's definitely been a big transition from Philly. I miss it, but it's a nice transition too. Um, I really do love our hospital system. I went to undergrad up in Jersey at Drew University where I studied um, neuroscience uh, and that's sort of what piqued my interest in medicine um, but from there it's kind of just spiraled and I I definitely do love what I do and I'm really passionate to share it with you all today. Well thank you for those amazing introductions. Um, I just want to remind everyone if you have questions please ask in the chat and we will definitely address them. And so moving into my first question, I just wanna jump right into it. How did you choose um, your medical program? I know there's so many across the country. So, you know, why Temple? Uh, maybe Megan, you can start us off. Sure, so um, when I was in undergrad, I, well, before undergrad, actually, I was convinced I did not want anything to do with medicine. So one of the first things I tell people about myself is that I was born with multiple chronic illnesses. Um, so I was in and out of hospitals a lot as a kid and wanted absolutely nothing to do with a hospital. Um, so as I got older and I, I was in college, I really liked science. And so I decided to do an internship in um, at an HIV program in Chicago. And it was at like a safety net hospital. It's called Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, and I loved it. I, I went back there like summer after summer in undergrad and I loved the patients. I loved the people. And I realized kind of that my experiences having been sick as a kid made me able to like empathize a lot with patients who maybe I didn't understand exactly their situations, but I, I understood that they were scared. And like, I, I understood the feelings of being in a hospital and feeling very afraid. Um, so I felt, I liked that that felt like a power to me and it took something that was always very scary and made it feel powerful to me. 
Um, and I loved working in, in a safety net hospital. Um, I loved being able to think about not just the medicine, but how do you think about all of the other factors? Like, can this patient um, get to their, do they have transportation to their appointments? Do they have food at home? Do they, you know, like all of the factors that influence somebody's medical care and how they achieve that. So that was really what I was looking for in a program was like a school where I felt like um, I would be able to do that with patients and not just learn medicine, but learn how to take care of people. Um, and so that was definitely what I found at Temple and I'm very glad I chose it here. I was hoping Joelle, if you could also speak on this question. Yeah, for sure. So I'm at Washington State University right now. Uh, it's actually a pretty new school. So it's been around for four years. We graduated our first class of medical students, our M4s last year, well, just a few months ago, um, which is really exciting. And part of the reason I chose it was because I've I had heard from a lot of people that had gone there about how unique of a program it was. Um, I When I was looking for medical schools, I was looking for what I call the three Cs, cost, comfort, and then community. Um, cost, obviously, <laughs> medical school is expensive. You want to be somewhere that you can get out of there and feel like you financially um, didn't go totally in debt, <laughs> just partially. Um, and Washington State University is in-state for me, so that was really nice to have that in-state tuition. Comfort, I wanted to make sure that I could be myself um, whenever I was, wherever I was, I could talk to people, I could talk to the professors, the administrators, the everyday people, the students, and feel as if I belonged in that space without having to um, kind of add extra stressors. I think we all know as medical students, it's stressful. We're studying all the time. So anything you can do to take um, off an additional stress off your plate is huge. And then community, so like where it was. And this was actually the one that Washington State University didn't really match up for. Um, it's in Spokane, Washington, which is predominantly white. And so I was one of, I've, I've always been used to being one of the few black people in a space, um, just growing up in Seattle, Washington. But um, it wasn't something that I was kind of coming back to because in New Haven, I'd been around um, a very different environment. But I knew that the community that my school had was really trying to do more to make a difference. And one interesting thing was that I found out when I came into the school was I was actually the first Black student at our school, even though there had been three classes beforehand. And so I actually took that as an opportunity to put, put together programming, put together um, different things like SNMA, which is Student National Medical Association. Um, I served on student council's president, so putting together different uh, task forces that can be that could help marginalized, different marginalized groups that were underrepresented in medicine. Um, so I think all these types of things kind of went into my thinking of where I wanted to be, wanting to know that I'd have an impact on wherever I went, and that when I left, it wouldn't be just kind of I left without having an impact or being known, but actually leaving something that could be lasting, making a difference afterwards. Wow, well, thank you. We're definitely gonna have to tap into mentorship um, after this. Maybe um, Alex, if you can also explain a little bit on, cause I know you go to Temple, but this specific program. Yeah, sure. So my program is a, a little bit smaller. So instead of the full 210, we actually only have 30 kids um, at our in our class sizes. So it's really honestly a great opportunity for more one on one sort of learning. Um, I'm really close to all the faculty members. And that was a big draw for me to come to the school as well, just because they they know so much more about you. And then that relationship sort of fosters the learning that you you do from them and the experiences that you have. Um, but I remember the main draw for me was the first time I walked into St. Luke's Hospital, I realized it didn't even look like a hospital at all. Um, it had couches everywhere. There was a really sweet coffee shop in the corner. There was a bunch of stuffed animals hanging in the gift shop. Um, and it just seemed like such more of a happy place than any hospital that I've really ever been to. And there was not a single person in there that wasn't smiling and welcoming you. And it's just that type of feeling is something that I wanted to feel every single day. Um, and that's sort of the feeling that I wanna bring into a room when I introduce myself to a patient. And so I just felt really at home. And compared to other schools, I didn't really have something that matched that feeling that the hospital gave me when I walked into it. Well, it's definitely inspiring seeing how you all picked, you know, these specific programs and have such detailed uh, reasons. And from that, I want to jump into, you know, you want to be somewhere where you're happy. So how has mentorship played a role? How do you find a mentor since you are all in your third year? How do you go about finding a mentor and how has that shaped maybe uh, what you do in medical school as well in terms of, and maybe we can start with Joelle in terms of, you said you took the opportunity to really create new programs. I'll leave it there. 
Yeah, I think mentorship is one of the most important things, especially in medicine. Um, and I think students understand that, but not entirely. You know, we oftentimes students are scared of networking, but the first step to getting a mentor is networking, which essentially is just telling people about yourselves. Who are you? Um, what are you doing? What are you interested in? Um, and so for me, what I did when I went to school is I wanted to get to know all the faculty members. So I joined organizations where I knew I'd be able to do that. Through student, that's part of the reason I did student council was I wanted to have a better relationship with my administrators. And as student body president, I had every Friday, I was leading sessions with um, every single person from the administration. So we'd have the Dean of curriculum and assessment and um, student affairs and all these different places. And so it was really cool for me to be able to form these relationships in a professional setting, but then be able to take it outside of there too and ask them for one-on-one -on -one coffee meetings or Zoom hangouts for this past year where we couldn't meet in person. Um, it became really fun because I, broke down that barrier that we often have with people that are our teachers or our administrators to really understand their personal lives and figure out that they love gardening and they love traveling and doing a lot of the same things that I like to do as well. So I think it's the first step to finding a mentor, sharing your passions with people that you typically wouldn't even know about. Um, and I guess one thing that happened last year and he's that formed my biggest mentor right now, um, his name is Dr. Gunther, he's an orthopedic surgeon in Virginia. And I'd gone to a conference just once, um, it, right, pri right prior to starting medical school, and had met him and his wife. Um, and he, I think I, just, I was talking to his wife, and she asked me, like, what are you interested in going into medicine when you go to medical school? I said, oh, I'm interested in, like, surgery of some sort, maybe orthopedics, maybe pediatrics, I don't know. And she's like, well, my husband is here, like, do you want to meet him? And I was like, why not? Uh, it's always nice to meet physicians. So talked to him, came really, like, we connected over uh, thinking about like health disparities and technology inside medicine throughout my whole first year I kept emailing him asking him if he had any research projects going on if I could do anything and he kept telling me don't ask just like go and do your work like just focus on studying and get those grades well at the end of the year COVID hit I was supposed to be at NYU for a program it got canceled I let him know that and I was like I'm not sure I'm gonna be gonna be doing this summer and out of nowhere I'd only met him once remember he invited me to come live with him for the entire summer with him, his wife, his two kids, um, and just like spend the summer doing research with him and shouting him in the hospital. So that's what I ended up doing. I ended up spending the entire summer with him. He became one of my biggest mentors, just like hanging out with him, talking with him. We went boating, went fishing for the first time, all this kind of stuff that I'd never done before. Um, it was really cool just like spending the summer with him. And now we have a paper published together in the Journal, journal of Bone and Joint Surgery that you're gonna be going next week to do a talk with him. So it was a serendipitous thing where I never could have imagined this, but it just happened to align and I had to put myself out there and also take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, I think finding mentors, you have to open yourself up to it, but also make sure you follow up on it too. Wow, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Megan or Alex, if you also wanna address this question, leave it open. Yeah, I think Joelle hit a lot of the points that I would talk about. I think I've also been very lucky um, to have very good mentors from the time that I was in undergraduate and doing like basic science research to discovering I wanted to go to medical school. And then now, like my biggest mentor, I would say, or the way I guess I'd say the way that I found mentors is I look for doctors who I, I like the way that they like practice medicine. Um, and I, I see people and I'm, I, there's one doctor, her name is Dr. Tudaldi who I work with and she works at prevention point, which is like a free clinic. And she was our mentor there. So I would always just try and go just to work with her. Um, because I loved the way that she treated patients and I loved getting to like learn how, how she actually just practiced medicine. Um, so that to me is, is something I look for in mentors is I just, even if it's like not a specialty that I'm interested in, um, I think you can, you can learn a lot from so many people who are in totally different fields too than you. Um, I have like a great geriatrics mentor. It's something I'm interested in, but she helps me like figure out the different, you know, she gives me resources now for like my geriatric psych patients. Um, and so things like that, it's been very helpful and, and very fulfilling. No, thank you. And, you know, you both touched on such great points and I, wanted to move into asking questions about as you're moving into your third year and starting rotations, um, as Megan mentioned, you know, it's so important developing that relationship with your patient, learning how to talk um, to patients, be a human. And then Joelle, you also mentioned the aspect of, you know, recognizing these disparities in medicine um, and diversity. So I wanted to ask the question, what prepared you most for, you know, going into now your third and fourth year of medical school and uh, what's like the best thing you did to 
get ready and prepare for that. Maybe Alex, you can start us off. Yeah, so um, I've actually, I've had a lot of conversations with people about this and it's funny because I think the first thing that people sort of jump to is, oh, like, what did you use to like study before medical school? Or like, what, what Kaplan course did you use to study for uh, your MCAT or whatever the case may be? But I actually don't think that the actual educational content is really where it's at at all. Website, the first word you got from. The first. A little small technical difficulties. We're good. Okay, maybe we'll move. You want? I can jump in. You want me to jump in? Okay. We'll, we'll circle back. <laughs> uh, so, um, for me, I think I mentioned I had that internship, and so what I did a lot there was working with like social workers. It was not like a very medical internship, right? I wasn't shadowing doctors. I had opportunities to, but I was mostly working basically with patients who were newly diagnosed with HIV or known to have HIV. Um, and when they'd come into the hospital, it was like, how do we link that person back into care and make sure that they are successful in achieve in like getting to the doctor's visit. So that was what I did was like, you know, assessing barriers. And I think that was probably the biggest preparation for med school. Cause now when I walk into rooms, I'm thinking about like, I'm kind of going through a list in my head of if I see, oh, the patient hasn't been here for four appointments. I'm like, huh, I wonder what's going on. And I don't jump to, I think in medicine, a lot of times there's a lot of blaming that's placed on the patient. And so I kind of am always like, well, what else could be going on? Um, and that was really good preparation. And I think just from working like with an interdisciplinary team. So I always tell people like, if you have job opportunities that are not necessarily like scribing or you know doing something very directly linked to patient care, that's okay too. Um, it will all prepare you. And circle back maybe to Alex now. Yeah, sorry. I mentioned the MCAT and my Google speaker went off trying to give me MCAT tips, which is just wild. Um, I guess I guess you can't ma get mad at a speaker for speaking. Um, but yeah, moving back on, I think the best advice that I was given in terms of actually preparing myself is that um, you can help your patients the most when you learn to listen the best. Um, because I feel like actually just listening and taking the time to hear what they have to say goes the longest way, longer than I can ever try to describe in this session. Um, the other day, I actually, I had a patient who um, I think represents this well, but he kept calling me Luisa, Luisa, Luisa. And I had introduced myself to him like multiple times throughout the day, right? When I was rounding or whatever. Um, and then he kept correcting himself. No, not Luisa, Alex, sort of under his breath. And then I sort of just took the time to listen and hear him out and said, hey, you keep mentioning Luisa. I was wondering if you'd like to talk about that. And then it turned out being that this person was somebody who really impacted him in his life and somebody that he misses a lot. And so just taking the sort of time to listen and hear my patient out, um, I think he ended up feeling better after the interaction. And it was something that where we were able to connect in a way that we wouldn't have if I didn't take the time to listen. And so it's just moments like that that make medicine so worth it. Um, you get to experience moments of vulnerability that I think are hard to find in, in other fields. And so, yeah, I would say listening and communication are probably the best skills to have. Thank you. Um, you know, assessing barriers, like you mentioned, Megan, and listening. A physician yesterday discussed how uh, Dr. Cueto, she said she walked into the room and, you know, you hear one story, but the real story is down here and you just have to kind of wait and hear it out. So um, amazing. Uh, maybe Joelle now uh, would love to hear your perspective. Yeah, I think one of the things that I did that I think really prepared me for medical school and just seeing patients was working as a clinical researcher. So before medical school, I took two years off um, and I did a master's program. As part of that, I worked at a clinical research center for a year. Um, I was looking at a trial that was looking at appendicitis and best treatment modalities of appendectomies, which is surgery versus antibiotics. Super fun. And it was like my, my first in hospital full-time thing. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that was interesting to me was before you go into a patient room, right? You look, you're looking at their chart and you think you have this whole story about who they are. And then you walk in and it can be totally different. It can be that there's a family member with them there or that um, maybe they can't speak or like you think they're gonna be looking better or looking worse than they actually are. 
So I think never knowing what you're going to walk into a hospital room seeing and not having any of those preconceived notions is the biggest thing I learned. Just don't walk in with like these, uh, the, this, thinking you know who the patient is without actually talking to them. Um, I think that's a hard thing to remember, especially when you get into medicine, which is all about teaching you how to use heuristics, shortcuts to understand who people are, because you need to be acting fast in case something is going wrong. But remembering that those shortcuts are great, but make sure they don't supersede the importance of getting to know that patient, having those one-on-ones, having those conversations, and going in with a blank slate, a tabula rasa, so that you can actually write that patient's story from what they're telling you and not what you think you're coming in with. Thank you for sharing. I keep reminding myself, you know, being intuitive without being intrusive, you know, this idea kind of keeps circling around. Um, I wanted to move into the aspect of, you know, we meet so many medical students, um, especially from the perspective of, of undergrad, but we don't hear the full story. So as you're moving into your third and fourth year, um, maybe speaking of some of the truths of the first and second year of medical school and how difficult it is and how you dealt with that burnout and what helped you stay motivated to, I know Megan, we were discussing before, uh, remembering medicine changes as you progress through medical school, of course. Uh, maybe Megan, you can get us started. Yeah, um, so I really struggled in my first years of medical school. Like I don't lie about that to people because I want people to know that it's it's like, it's hard and it's okay to, to have a hard time. Um, I had a lot of things going on in my family and just personally. And so it definitely affected me. Um, I think I, what I, what the, was the most helpful for me was just understanding kind of um, that I needed to also be a human outside of school. Um, so I spent a lot of time like trying to fill my cup back up. And for me, I think the biggest thing that rejuvenated me was being around patients. So I had a really great precept. I have a great preceptor who's in the emergency room and she just would really encourage me. Like when I was having a hard time, she'd be like, come on in, come do a shift with me. And, you know, I would, I would get to see people and I would get to like be with people in some of the scariest moments of their lives. And like, that is such a humbling thing I think to do. And one of the most humbling things about medicine to me. Um, and so to, to, to take that step back and be like, all right, that's why I'm here. And it sounds cheesy, but it, it really was helpful to me. And I, um, I'm very thankful for that. And also just like, take time for yourself. Um, like it's okay to take a Friday off from studying and to take a weekend day off, like do things that you love and you will be a good whole person at the end of it. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, maybe Joelle, you can provide all of you who just have such different experiences. I want to hear it all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I loved my first years in medical school. And I think I will say for sure, I struggled, especially coming in because I, I, I mean, I had to do a post back program because my GPA wasn't what I, where I wanted it to be. Um, but I think coming in, I was so happy I'd done that post back program because it really helped me be able to use the two years to kind of explore the other sides of medicine because um, I spent so much time in my grad program making sure I had the skills when I got to medical school. Um, and so my first two years were a blast. I think people always make medical school out to be all studying and there is a lot of studying, but we have a lot of fun. So most weekends I would be out with friends. I'd be hanging out. We do a lot of game nights. Um, I lived with four other medical students as well. So that was awesome for me because it was just a med school house. And so we all were on the same schedule where after a test would be done, we would all go out and have fun. We had our traditions where we went to Red Robins afterwards. We had bars where we take a shot right after we took the exam, <laughs> things like that, where it made medical school more fun and reminded you that there's the, the element of life that's still out there. You're going to miss things like weddings and all these big milestones and births. But I think when you can take the moment, take the opportunity to um, remember kind of what makes you refills your cup. Like Megan said, I love that phrase, what refills you and rejuvenates you. For me, it's traveling and hiking and the outdoors. Do those things when you have the time to, and they'll make, make the time fly by. Well, thank you. And I wanted to just jump back to you for a moment and ask about your post back experience. Um, I know a lot of students, you know, don't think they need to do one or are scared to. So what advice do you kind of have in terms of um, doing a post-bac program and also where to look when you're you know, starting this process? Mm -hmm. So I'd say a post-bac program isn't for everyone. Um, if you think you have a decent GPA and a decent MCAT, like apply. Um, you can, if, you, if you're worried about finances, there are opportunities to get things paid for 
um, actually pitch black men in white coats right now is helping to pay for MCAT exams and things. So if you go to the website uh, and you are worried about paying for the MCAT, you have to take it coming up. They're paying up to, I think, $250 or something. They're also giving out Kaplan books as well, where you just sign up and they'll send you a full set for free. So black men in white coats is doing that. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, post back isn't for everyone. I did it because my GPA wanted to show an upward trajectory. Um, I'd done way better in my junior and senior year, but my freshman and sophomore year, there was definitely struggles there and it was rocky. First time I took my MCAT, I wasn't too happy about it. So I wanted to get more bi biology. And I'll say I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to medical school. So I wanted to use that grad program to really figure out if I could do it. The post back I chose, um, I had had a friend that had done it before. It was called Boston MAMS. Boston, I was at Boston University. It's a really hard program, um, but honestly, I will say it was harder than my first years of medical school. And I think that was what I needed to really build my confidence coming back in. I've had friends that have gone to um, Penn or Georgetown SMP. Um, there's some at, uh, in California, Scripp. So there's a lot of different ones. I put together a list, looked at all of them, found people that went there, contacted them and asked about their experience. The big thing you want to do is know what you want to get out of it. If your end goal is to get to medical school, make sure you figure out if people are actually going to medical school once they take that program. There are places you will go to and people don't match anywhere or don't get into medical schools. Boston MAMS have been around for, I think, what, 40 years now. And so it has a long track record of letting people in. Um, and I knew people that were now doctors that had done that program. So I think really do your research on it and make sure you're not just paying money um, to pay money. Make sure you're getting something out of it. Well, thank you. I know that advice will serve many. Uh, maybe we can circle back now and Alex, you can address the question on uh, how do you deal with burnout uh, and what helps you stay motivated? Yeah, so I mean, I echo a lot of things that uh, Joelle and Megan were saying before, but I think for me, it was just remembering that yes, you are a medical student, but you're also a human and you need things that are going to make you feel like a human and not so much like a robot. And so for me, I sort of found hobbies that humanize me and it's sort of things that maybe I didn't do prior to medical school, but I found them really helpful after. Like I go hiking more now than I ever did. And I go camping now more than I ever did. Um, and I just spend, even if it's a weekend trip, you have to realize that that weekend is not lost study time. It's actually, you're investing in yourself, which is also equally as important as investing in your academics. And it, it will serve you way, I think, more benefit in the long run than just forcing yourself to sit at a table for hours on end and keep grinding when you can't grind anymore. So definitely grind, but also play hard too. Now, I really like what you said about investing in yourself and maybe we can expand on that. What experiences in your undergrad and this is, I think, addressing also a question in the chat. What specific things did you do that helped you prepare for medical school? Um, but especially, you know, like you guys have been just echoing what you've said all day. It's not just about grinding and getting that work done, but, you know, because as you have to apply to medical school, really building that application. So what are the maybe classes, if you can focus on classes and then whether it was volunteering or research, what was most important for your journeys? Uh, maybe, Joelle, if you could start us off. I was scared of research. I was so scared of research. I did zero research in undergrad. Um, uh, not zero. I did like one paper, but it didn't get published until I was like after I applied and got in. Um, but my thing was leadership and volunteering. So I've had a nonprofit for a few years. It's called Hugs for Ghana. And we raise school supplies, medical supplies, and sports equipment. And we take that to Ghana, West Africa every few years. Um, and we try and go every two years. This year we couldn't go because of um, COVID, but we went in 2019. But that was one of my big ones, student government. Um, I did task forces. And um, I know this is a later question, but that was one of my leadership roles that was kind of related to LGBT advocacy work um, in terms of looking for gender neutral housing, um, trying to get more funding for uh, the LGBT office that we had on campus, things like that. Um, and then my other thing that I was, I was really big on um, was mentoring. So I ran a mentorship program in New Haven at two different schools. We were really lucky to have a budget of $75,000 and we could kind of do whatever we wanted with that. So we paid our mentors and then we also did some really awesome programs. We bring in the reptile man to show the kids what does an alligator look like? Um, what do they eat? What do they do? Like uh, snakes and stuff like that. And the kids always would always love that. We went to New York and went to the Stomp Off Broadway show. We went to Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. So, um, and the kids that we worked with were low income. Um, they were often failing out of their classes 
I remember it was a three-year program too. So all our mentors were there from our sophomore to senior year and with students from their sixth to eighth grade years. So getting that longitudinal me mentorship with them. And it was absolutely incredible seeing um, just how engaged they were by the end of the three years as opposed to the beginning. Because our whole purpose wasn't to get them to be better students, but to understand how education can enhance their lives in the end. So um, I think those things were what I wanted to do and they didn't really fit into the the science mindset, which I think a lot of students feel like they have to do. But I think as long as you can explain, how does this connect to being a doctor? You want a doctor that shows humility, that cares about your patients. Um, and you, if you do volunteering, if you do um, other things that you're passionate about, as long as that passion sh shines through, um, medical schools will like that. Thank you for sharing. And someone asked, <laughs> how do you accomplish all of these things while in medical school? <laughs> Maybe you can just give a brief comment on also just organization because you are super busy. Yeah, you can't see it right now, but I have a whiteboard desk now and I have whiteboards all around me. <laughs> so my days are like, I wake up in the morning and they're scheduled out by the hour. So uh, it's it's been it's been very fascinating. My roommates are, are like, hey, can we hang out? I'm like, you're not on the schedule right now. So ask me tomorrow. <laughs> I made the schedule. <laughs> um, okay, so now circling back to the question, maybe Megan, if you wanna go next. Yeah, sure. So I actually was somebody who loved research. Um, so like I was saying, I wasn't sure that I wanted to go to medical school, but I did know I, I applied to one school. I applied to all schools for musical theater um, undergrad, and then I applied to one school for um, biology. So I decided to do bio. Um, and as soon as I got in, I was taking a class. It was like a discovery class. So it wasn't really intense, but it was it was like for freshmen, just like to give them a teaser of something like a more specific biology. So it was called human reproductive physiology. And it was like all about, you know, like the endocrine aspects and endocrine physiology underlying like the reproductive system. And I had this really passionate old professor um, who was an emeritus professor and he just loved to teach. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. He taught me all about like his research um, that he had done. And I was like, can you like help me find somebody to do research with, you know? So, and this goes back to mentorship. So he sent an email to everybody in his department and was like, I have this student, um, you know, and she's very interested in research. She's a freshman. Like she doesn't really know anything, but like she's very passionate. And so I actually was very lucky to meet my um, former PI who was, it was her, like she had just joined the university and had no graduate students in her lab, no fellow, uh, no postdocs. So basically it was, a couple undergrads and her and she like taught me basically for my four years of undergrad like hands on really taught me how to do research which was very cool and allowed me to um, eventually like um, we published a paper about I studied um, gender bias regulation of bile acids and how that contributes to liver cancer development. Um, so that was really exciting. And I actually ended up staying two extra years after undergrad there to finish up that work um, just because I was so involved in it. Uh, so research for me was a, a huge thing. Um, for, and I, I think um, by the end of it, though, I, I was ready to be with patients. Um, and that's when I started working at Brigham and Women's doing more clinical research. Um, and that was like a nice welcome, uh, you know, like Joelle was saying, like going into the hospital and actually like being with patients doing, even if you're just doing research is awesome. So I loved that. Um, and then I was a molecular and cellular biology major. So I, I just like my classes, I really enjoyed and like really prepared me and gave me a good foundation for med school. Well, thank you. And being aware of the time, I want to move into part two of the Q&A and start discussing LGBTQ and diversity in STEM. And I wanted to start off with um, how is being a member of the LGBTQ community impacted how you have approached health? Uh, maybe, Alex, you can start us off. Yeah, so um, this is such a tough question, <laughs> but it's an important question, definitely. I think in terms of how I've actually approached healthcare and maybe how I've interacted interacted with patients, my identity has probably played a role. And as of recently, I've been um, presenting more masculine than I had prior to medical school. And so I was really nervous sort of going in and starting interactions with patients. Like, are they gonna be accepting of me? Will they look at me differently? Um, like, how's my hair before I go into the room? And I think it took me a while to realize, or the three weeks of rotation actually, because we're really fresh into this um, this third year thing for sure, um, that patients that I've experienced um, sessions with really don't 
care about all of that stuff as much as I thought. And I was putting a lot more weight into it than I think was necessary at first. And I think there definitely will be negative interactions you have with people. Like um, I was at the grocery store today and I definitely got looks at the grocery store before coming into this session and, and sort of felt a little bit judged. But I think that while those experiences can shape the way that you go about life and, and interact with people that I was definitely more scared than I needed to be. And now that I realize that my interactions with patients have gotten a lot better and a lot more natural because I'm focusing on them. I'm not focusing on myself as much. Um, and I think that's the sort of headspace that I needed to get into. Um, but aside from that, I really haven't had my identity affect my patient care really all that much um, personally. Thank you. And I wanted to move to Joel also for this question, as I know you have a huge platform where you're addressing racial disparities as well in medicine. So along with that in LGBTQ, how has that um, changed your approach um, into the healthcare field? Yeah, I think for me, um, so speaking on the platform first, I love being able to interact with people. And like, my, so my platform on TikTok is about talking about health disparities, but just disparities in general that exist, right? Whether that's gender, sexual, or racial. Um, and my favorite part is just seeing people share their stories. And it reminds me of just what, what people go through on the day to day when they're going to a doctor. So many of my comments are things like, I felt like I wasn't heard by the doctor, or I went in hoping for this, and I just felt ignored because the doctor said, oh, you probably don't feel pain, I'm not going to give you that, or they judged me because of how I looked, or how I presented, whatever it was, um, and so I think as a member of the LGBT community, too, like, I I feel that, too, you know, when I go into the, the doctor's office, when they ask things like sexual partners, sometimes I feel awkward about, like, do I lie here, or do, it's going to be recorded all the time, and understanding that and how a patient feels about that, I think is huge. And that's something that we all can relate to because we have all had to struggle with it at some point in our lives. And we know that when patients come in and have to be their true authentic selves in that moment, that might be the first time they're ever doing that. That might be the first time they've ever told anyone something like that. And so remembering that and just, I guess, I think that's the beauty of the position we're in. Like we understand what it's like to not be in the majority all the time what it feels like to have to think about those types of things. And I think it can help us connect to our patients in a more authentic and better way. So I think that's one thing I think about a lot, how I understand the vulnerability it takes as a patient and how I, as a physician, can make sure to foster that and really respect that bond. Thank you. And um, I wanted to move into, because being aware of the time, uh, maybe Megan, you can address, have you ever experienced or seen homophobia, transphobia in the workplace? What happened if you have a story and then how did that change how you um, continued um, on a daily basis? Yeah, so I actually, I'm very fortunate in that, like as a gay woman, I present, you know, and I can pass as, as straight. And I think that um, until until medical school, I, I mean, I was out, but I think I have been more loudly out since I'm in medical school. And because of the fact that I want my patients to know that like, when I walk in that room, like if, you know, I want them to see like, yes, like you see that rainbow pin and like, know that it's okay to tell me whatever they want. Because I know that when like, I've seen that pin on a doctor's coat, like I can still tell you, tell you the first doctor that I didn't lie to about my boyfriend. Um, so like doctors would always say like, it would be like, oh, are you sexually active? And then you'd say yes. And then it'd be like, oh, what does your boyfriend do? And I re still remember that mental, like the like gymnastics, like of my entire teenage and adolescent years. And even like into my twenties of just being of lying and just being, oh yeah, my boyfriend does this like substituting he for she. Um, and so I, I think about that a lot, but that's off the topic. Sorry. I have not particularly experienced homophobia. Um, I've been very fortunate, but I don't know if any of the other panelists like haven't want to speak to that. I mean, I, I was just gonna jump in and say that's a powerful story still though, like what you said, and that is in a way, right? It's like how society looks at us and how we as medical students are trained. Um, Cause we don't often get trained in how we use inclusive language like that. And that, that can be the difference right there of like whether that patient's gonna tell you everything about their sexual history, anything about their sexual history could be so pertinent to diagnosing them with something with the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, and it could be so benign, like just, you know, I know that most of the doctors who did that, like they didn't have mat like bad intentions. It's just the natural assumption, but like those assumptions can be so hurtful. 
Um, even like when I walk into patients room instead, patients rooms instead of like saying like, oh, is this so-and-so? Cause I've, I mean, I, I've heard stories about people mistaking like a partner, you know, for somebody's mom um, or something like that. So just like asking the patient like, oh, who's with you today? Instead of saying like, oh, is this your wife or your boyfriend or whatever? Um, so, yeah. You know, and I think that's where it becomes so difficult of seeing when do you cross that line of being intrusive when you're really just trying to figure out the whole story. Um, but moving into, maybe we only have time for one more question, but I want to address it. Uh, how do you achieve leadership roles as part of the LGBTQ community and not just, you know, within that community, but beyond? Uh, maybe Alex, you can start us off. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is a topic that I'm really passionate about personally, just because I know before I came into medical school, um, I, I even questioned if I was even going to come out in my application, right? It's something that I think a lot of people have anxiety about. And I was sort of in that same road um, where I was like, can I see myself in a leadership role? Will my identity actually end up affecting how far I go in medicine? And I honestly don't think that that's been the case at all. Um, I think starting out, I, I started out as just the president of the art club and that was sort of my first stepping stone and getting myself into a leadership role. But now I'm president of the LGBTQ plus group. I'm a part of the diversity and inclusive task force. And I also just um, as of like a few weeks ago became a member of the admissions committee for my school. So it's, it's like, it, you can get as many leadership roles as sort of you put yourself out there for. And I, I don't think it has to be an obstacle for you. I know it definitely can be. Um, unfortunately, I think that's, that's the way it is. It can be, but I don't want anybody to be afraid of putting themselves out there and going after what they wanna do um, just because they may identify a certain way or have a certain identity that they think may keep themselves from that opportunity for sure. Thank you. And you know, maybe Joelle, if you can speak on this as well in terms of leadership. Mm -hmm, yeah, and I also want to maybe talk about some leadership outside of medical school that you can look at too. I think there are so many opportunities as well to look at LGBT organizations that are doing really amazing things. And I think medical students, yes, we're super busy. So oftentimes we don't look at these places, but they need people like us that are thinking about the healthcare system while we're still in it. So one of the organizations I'm involved with, um, I helped my friend start, it's called Hope in a Box. And what they do is they put together material, um, curriculum guides, uh, books, different literature, and they actually send them to um, high schools to give teachers opportunities to actually teach LGBT curriculum, especially if they don't have the tools to do it. And it's awesome because now they're in all 50 states. They've sent it to numerous schools all over. And it's a way for students to see themselves represented in media, in books, in literature, in movies that they often haven't. And for me, it's been one of the coolest things to be a part of as a medical student uh, because you hear a lot about uh, just like mental health and seeing representation, how much that can help people in terms of uh, health wise and like reducing stress and reducing anxiety and social pressure. And so to know that there's organizations outside that you can be a part of is just as important. Then of course, within you can find things. Um, I think it just takes that step, say, saying, telling yourself that um, there's no one more qualified than yourself. You know, you know everything that you do and just kind of hyping yourself up and jumping for that leadership role. If it doesn't go well, oh well, you can go and try another one, but you learn something from it that's gonna help you on the, on, the, on the next step and the next step of your journey. Thank you. And also in terms of next steps and navigating life, I wanted to address the question in the chat, uh, which says, as far as applications, interviews, mentors, professors, et cetera, how much do you divulge about your sexuality in a professional setting? And I guess with everything else, uh, maybe Megan, you can start us off. Yeah, Petra, thank you for that question, because it was something that I really struggled with during my application process. Um, I was fortunate to know a few people who were out and in medical school at the time, um, so I could kind of like bounce ideas off of them. But I ultimately decided that I wanted to be like out. So I mentioned my sexuality in my personal statement um, because I wanted I didn't want to be accepted somewhere that like wouldn't accept me if they knew that I was gay. Um, so it ultimately came down to that, like, yes, there are places that I think maybe it like did affect my application. I mean, maybe not, but I think if it did, that's, that's fine. Cause I don't, I wouldn't have wanted to be there like with, if they didn't want me, um, and wouldn't have been okay with that. And so, um, in terms of like pre mentors and preceptors, things like that, like, I don't 
say it outright, but like if it comes up in conversation, if we're talking about, you know, like our significant others or things like that, I don't, I don't hide it anymore. I spent a lot of my life, like, and not that there's anything wrong with, with like being, you know, in the closet, but I think for me, like I spent a lot of my life, like switching pronouns and kind of just trying to fit in and just skate under the radar. And I just decided that like, it was going to do the most good for the most people, um, like for myself and also just like for my patients, for future um, people who want to be in medicine. Like I had mentors who I had looked up to who were out and physicians, and that was really powerful to me. So I wanted to also be that person. Well, thank you. And maybe Alex, you can also address this question also in terms of how you present yourself, you know, others who might, you know, struggle with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think for a long time, um, similar to Megan, I was sort of not sure how much I wanted to come out in medical school, if I wanted to come out beforehand. Um, but I think being in medical school has sort of really made me realize that your sexual orientation, the way that you identify, doesn't make you any less of a professional than somebody else. Um, and that I think is a good realization to have because then you're comfortable, like, like Megan spoke about, speaking about your significant others freely. Um, like, I don't, I don't think anybody should really be like, oh yes, like this is my relationship and this is what I'm doing all the time and, and uh, like all of this stuff um, in a professional setting anyway, just because that's not the natural course of conversation, right? Like if you're talking about patients, you're not really talking about like your social life outside. Um, but if it comes up in conversation, I really don't think that there's any need to hide it if you are the person that wants to be out. Um, I haven't had that experience and I don't, I don't think it's really, impacted anything um, at Temple. Temple's really good about being open um, and being your authentic self is definitely something that's feasible there. I've never felt like Temple has done anything but add to my experience in medicine. Um, but as far as maybe presenting wise, I think I've had a few um, physicians that I've worked with actually, like I said before, patients haven't really been my problem. Um, physicians have sort of pointed it out or um, I actually, I wear my pronoun pin um, like Megan too. And that was a, a point where uh, I had a physician sort of turn to me and say, oh, Lex, you're not one of those, are you? And that's when I sort of stepped back and realized like maybe the way I present myself does impact um, my interactions professionally sometimes. Um, but I think it's important to, like I said, like take a step back, um, recognize the the space you're in and, and that that interaction doesn't have to dictate the rest of your course through medicine or your medical uh, education. And that's not been the majority of my experiences at all. And so I think having those sort of shape my journey has also been helpful, knowing that those things may happen, but it doesn't have to be the end all be all of the rest of your course through medicine. I mean, I was wondering if you're comfortable, um, it's a powerful story, if you don't mind sharing how you responded and reacted in that situation. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I actually turned to the person and I said, what do you mean by that, right? So I wanted to open it up. Um, what do you mean you're not one of those, right? Because to me, gender identity for me is different than maybe what they might expect my sexual identity to be. So I just wanted to unpack that a little bit. Um, and then they sort of went off and said, oh, your generation, it, you can identify as anything and you can do anything that you want. And it, it was going down that path. And I really didn't know how to respond in that moment because I didn't wanna face any backlash if I'm being honest, because in medicine, there's a hierarchy, right? And sometimes you could be scared to sort of speak up to members of the community that are higher up in the journey than you are, right? Now we're medical students, but then there's residents and physicians and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I corrected them and I said, well, just because I'm wearing, I, I, I like the saying, don't hate, educate. So I actually took the moment and I said, well, this is a pronoun pin. I, de I identify as a woman and I use she, her pronouns. And I sort of explained that that was my gender identity. And that was all that the pronoun pin meant. Um, and then I think it sort of silenced them and, and took the microphone away from them because they weren't educated on the topic enough to have a response to it. Um, and I think that it was helpful to sort of not maybe face the situation with anger and frustration, although that's maybe the response that 
sometimes I wish that I had in that moment, right? Because sometimes you get so worked up about things that you're passionate about, but calming yourself down, recognizing your space that you're in and responding in a professional way that can be helpful to that person, I think is, is something to keep in mind when you're faced with those types of situations. Because everybody else that was in the room, it wasn't just us and, and they're all seeing me respond to that too. And I don't wanna give them maybe a false representation of the person I am just because I'm frustrated and hurt and upset. But those feelings also are valid, right? So I can go home and I can and talk about those feelings and feel those feelings too and experience them. But yeah, I think just recognizing the space that you're in and, and knowing how to respond ahead of time, maybe before those situations happen are helpful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that experience. As you said, it's through education and that um, experience I think can help, you know, a lot of people in this space in terms of maintaining that, you know, professional aspect while still, you know, correcting someone when they're wrong. Uh, there's no issue with that. And, you know, last but not least, maybe Joelle, if you can, you want to address this question as well. Yeah, so I, I still struggle with it, knowing like how much to disclose, how much not to disclose. Um, I think in my primary application, I ended up not talking about it, but in my secondaries, I put it in there in some of them, the ones that offered me an opportunity to talk about it. There were some schools that said, talk about your identity. And I definitely put it in there, um, and especially my relationship being, I have African parents. And so it's a very strange relationship in that sense um, of just like having to think about it. And I, I think that, for me, at least was a powerful story to share and like also like connect to why I want to go into medicine and how I can connect to different communities. But um, even today, like when I, I think I, I really liked what both Lex and Megan said in terms of um, like, it's not always going to come up when you're in kind of the clinic, but if it does, um, like being open about it, sharing it, sharing your story, because I think that's how you make change and how you change people's opinions. Um, I always talk about the fact that gay marriage is actually the fastest changing issue in the United States it's ever changed. And part of the reason why is because people have conversations about it um, and that you might not know that someone that you love is queer and then you find out and then it makes you have to reconcile with that. I think that's exactly what we have an opportunity to do being medical students um, where the LGBT population isn't often represented in this community. Um, and then being able to be with older generations of people who will only see these people as patients, right? Not as people where we can change the, their mindset and actually change how they, they see um, the LGBT population and think differently about people that are trans or um, what it means to have gender versus sexual identities. So yeah, I think when given the opportunity, I, I do um, just to educate. Um, but I'm still kind of coming to terms with it myself. So I'm not entirely there yet. I don't know how to kind of, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I don't wear it on my sleeve as much. And I think I do have privilege as well, um, where I'm passing as well, um, where people won't always know. Sometimes they'll suspect and be like, I think so. But, you know, like, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really still trying to work it out. I think it's an ongoing journey, which is the beauty of it. Well, thank you so much for being so personal and sharing that experience. Uh, we only have five or so minutes left. So I want to give each of you the opportunity to share, you know, your best piece of advice um, on, you know, whatever it is, whether it's mental health or undergrad medical school. Uh, Megan, take it away. <laughs> oh, right on the spot, right away. Um, okay, so I think I would say, I mean, I think really just going with the theme of like, I mean, this is Pride Month. And I think like, no matter, you know, whether you identify as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, like um, just being authentic to who you are and like whatever that identity is. So for me, that's like, you know, being queer and also like my identities as a patient. And those are weird intersect intersecting identities that I just was like, all right, I'm going to embrace these things. I'm going to be authentic to them. And so like, be true to who you are when you're, um, no matter, I mean, where you end up, um, I think, but I think definitely in medical school, it really helps because there are patients who are like you. Um, and if you're part of a, you know, a marginalized group, like there are patients who are likely suffering from health disparities because of their marginalized status. Um, and you are now in a position where, you know, you can advocate for them. And I think that's one of the best parts of medicine. So definitely be authentic to yourself. Well, thank you. Uh, maybe Alex, if you want to go next. Yeah, so I think um, probably a good piece of advice for everyone is to just be kind to yourself. 
um, your journey throughout life is not going to be perfect. And I think that your journey through STEM and medicine and being a professional or whatever you choose to do is not always going to be perfect. There's going to be twists and turns and unexpected things that happen that sort of knock you down once in a while, but meet yourself with kindness and know that nobody's perfect and you're not an exception to that. None of us are. Um, and that's totally okay. Being imperfect is great. And I think it's something that makes life really great. And so just recognizing that and doing things that fill yourself up and, and make you happy when things don't go as planned. Thank you. And last but not least, Joel. Yeah, so I think I'll end it by sharing one of my favorite quotes by someone. Um, so Victor E. Frankel, he was an American neurologist and psychiatrist and philosopher um, who was a Holocaust survivor as well. And he dedicated his whole entire life to searching for the meaning of life. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from his book is it goes between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies our, our, in our in that space lies our power to choose. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And it's all about the, the idea that when you have a decision to make or when you're going through something, whether it's something that has set you back or is pushing you forward, we can choose how we're gonna to respond to that and how we're gonna use that moment. So I think for a lot of us, um, we struggled as you heard here, that whether it was academically or just like figuring out who we were, but we had that choice to either let that be a setback for us or something that's gonna make us and push us forward. Just like how you see a block, if you stumble across it, it can be something that makes you fall down or you can step up and use it to kind of launch to the next thing. So my biggest suggestion is just, if you're going through anything, know that it's part of life, that it's gonna help you grow in the end and that it can be something that launches you into your next phase of your career. Well, thank you all so much for uh, being so personal with your stories and extremely professional. You've all accomplished so much and it seems as though you're so successful because of how mindful you all are and staying true to not only yourselves, but being authentic in the field and exploring your passions, you know, whether for Megan, it's, you know, loving research or Joelle, you know, especially, you know, leadership and really uh, growing in that sense. So, I want to just say thank you again for taking the time out of your day to participate in this panel. Your presence here will help guide so many students into a successful STEM career. Um, I also want to thank everyone who has been um, supporting us um, and STEM potential and coming to these panels this entire weekend. I'm really excited to see all of you on the um, STEM Potential Discord. I also just want to mention that the recording of this webinar will be posted on our Discord and on YouTube. And all of the panelists' um, biographies are on the website as well. Um, maybe if you guys want to drop your social media links, if you're comfortable, um, you can do that. But I will reach out personally to the panelists to get their emails and put them on the website. Um, but again, thank you to everyone um, for making this possible. I so appreciate, uh, this is definitely the best panel in my opinion, don't tell anyone, but uh, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you all have an amazing afternoon. And again, one last big thank you to Megan, Alex, and Joelle for uh, being amazing and definitely a mentor to me. So thank you all. I hope you have a great day. <laughs>